C. Okay, so the recording started. So welcome everyone to the June 2023 uh, Microsoft 365 Modern Management Meetup. Uh, so uh, today, uh, so I'm Mark O'Shea, I'm here. Uh, Steve's here, he's, he's wandering around downstairs uh, giving people physical access to the building in a secure and controlled manner. And I think Jerome has just joined or is about to join. He'll be joining remotely. Uh, we've got a few people, yeah, so we've got a few people who are also going to be joining us in person up here shortly. Uh, but we've, you can probably already see that I'm not alone in the room at the moment. We've got Aresh, who's going to be doing most of the speaking for tonight. So Steve and I get to sit back for most of this and have a bit of a rest. And it is and high time to yeah, deserve yeah, some rest on this forum. You, yeah, you've got to earn your keep today, Steve. <laughs> Uh, so, pretty simple agenda today, just, um, you know, anyone who's new who hasn't sort of joined a session before, uh, I, I see a few more people are starting to join. Uh, if you just wanted to either, like, like at, in the next section, drop a few comments into chat about yourself or unmute to introduce yourself, just a couple of things around some of the Intune updates that have taken place over the last month since our last meeting. But then we'll sort of switch into the main thing that we're here for today, which is Aresh going through, uh, you know, the latest Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop updates. So uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be quite a bit to cover off there. And then uh, after that, we'll just sort of jump over into our general discussion. So if we just sort of then jump in and we take a look at the first bit here, just introductions. Anyone who's new, uh, who hasn't joined before, or maybe someone who's been, if anyone's been missing in action for a while, please feel free to you know, either unmute to do an intro or just drop a welcome, drop a hello into chat uh, with a, a few details about yourself. Um, but it looks like recognizing most, but not all of the all of the names. Um, And if everyone is too shy to, to say anything, that, that's okay as well. Um, but uh, please feel free to ask questions, et cetera, as we go through uh, uh, the content today. Uh, did, oh, uh, Lubomir is typing. So, so first of all, Lubomir, where are you based is probably a good question. Oh, okay, in in the UK. Okay. So, so it's it's breakfast time. It's morning coffee time for you. And some people might say it's too late in the day over here to have coffee, but there's, I may have evidence in my hand that it's never too late. Never too late. Like it's only it's not even six p.m. It's very very early in the day. <laughs> oh, so so yeah, Phil, beer o'clock. Some of us have to drive home after this, Phil. I think you're probably already sitting at home with a, with a beer in front of you, and it's probably you know world's greatest dad koozie to keep it cool. <laughs> I'm not making any assumptions there at all, Bill. Uh, Bill, about that. Bok has even more better options. Oh yeah, espresso martini. So that's yeah, good. That's a good compromise. Caffeine and alcohol. I know. So that means that makes it. No, I shouldn't say what I was about to say. I'd be, it would be encouraging breaking laws in most, if not all countries. <laughs> okay, uh, you, you too, it's always, always good to have people uh, join. Okay, so with that, let's just quickly go through just a few updates. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm uh, pretty sure that, you know, once we get into Win365 and ADD, uh, we'll probably have more than enough to fill out uh, the evening uh, or the morning, depending on where you are. So just a few of the uh, updates that I've sort of picked out from the, you know, what's new in Intune over the last month. And if any of these are sort of critical things that you think we really need to spend more time on. Uh, this is something that we can definitely you know, plan to incorporate in future events. So uh, 
So in this case, let's just go through a few of them. So I thought I'd start off with one that I just wanted to get some feedback from people on it. So with organizational messages for Windows 11 now being generally available, are any of you using organizational messages in Intune at all? So against Win 10 or now against Windows 11? How many of you are actually using it as a notification system? Because I'm always curious about, you know, some of the features that get quite a bit of attention when they're announced, but then when they do hit general availability, there's, there's normally a bit of a lag before they actually start getting you, getting used. I'm not seeing an overwhelming number of responses come through to this one. So I take it as that, okay, that's one that is um, uh, good. Uh, Dominic, Dominic's typing in. And it looks like he's typing in more than no. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> okay, so now the, the second point on here, there's a whole bunch of different stuff going on with this second bullet point. So the Intune now differentiates Windows devices if they're um, uh, Windows Server versus Windows Client devices. Now, there's um, there's actually a bit more to this overall Windows Server versus you know, Windows Client story here as well that also extends over into the way devices will start to register into Defender for Endpoint as well. So this is something that I'm thinking we might uh, it's probably not worth an entire session on its own, but there's enough Windows Server stuff that we can roll into a conversation for those of you who still do have some Windows servers in your environment. Now, we are not going to turn this into a Windows Server-focused session. Uh, we are going to be talking to you about Windows Server, DHCP, and DNS, and Active Directory. Um, instead, it's just how does it integrate with Intune? How does it, yeah, and how, how yeah, what, what is the purpose of it showing up? But on the Defender for Endpoint side, that's one where I think it's probably worth taking a bit more of a closer look at that. Now, the next two are MAM updates. So, uh, so basically, assignment filters uh, for app protection policies and app configuration uh, policies. Updates to reporting. So, welcome. Um, new security baselines for M365 apps slash Office apps, depending on what it is you want to call them or what Microsoft documentation you're looking at. It's called app, right? So, Matt, Matt, Microsoft apps. This is the, the, the hang on. New, new security baselines. Oh, I thought you were talking about ma'am. Oh, no, we were. That was when you were outside the room. Okay. Yeah, we finished talking about that now. Good. good. Um, that's that's good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. And then the final one here, even though I don't think many, or let's let's be blunt, I don't think any of you are probably particularly excited about Dynabook now supporting DFCI and being able to be you know, managing firmware through Intune. But the reason why I've included this one here is that for such a long time period, Surface devices were the only devices out there that support supported DFCI. So even though Microsoft said, hey, yeah, we've made this open, other people can leverage it, et cetera, was it maybe a year or so ago, Acer, yeah, Acer showed up, uh, now with Dynabook in, uh, in here as well. Um, so this is something that is, you know, if you're not familiar with this, this is just really where you can go through and start I'll stick to the surface side because I know the kinds of things we can control on the surface side. But and at some to some level, it's okay. I don't know why that. How did you make that? I don't know. So we just had a dropout over here. We don't know why, but we'll blame Steve. Definitely my fault because everything was working fine before you got in here. The camera decided to turn itself off. Yes. Yeah, so the team room decided to reset itself momentarily yeah but it's okay hopefully Just to confirm everybody can still hear us can i get a thumbs up Jerome? yeah good oh, excellent thanks cool thanks yeah so on so just on the surface side so think of it in terms of being able to like just like through firmware disable 
um, disable Wi-Fi, disable the USB port, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's you know, fairly, you know, like I wouldn't say that you know, anyone who loves doing it like a deep dive into firmware and changing CPU states for power saving and all that kind of stuff, that's not really what this is for. This is just really about, you know, what are the things that we want to control uh, in terms of some pretty high level hardware capabilities. So, you know, things like camera, you know, disabling cameras if these are devices going into a secure environment, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so that's something that hopefully we, yeah, well, hopefully we start seeing more of this come through. Now, that also in terms of other, you know, other hardware vendors. Um, now, the next thing here is just a couple of things to keep an eye out for in the portal that have been updated. So the first one kind of starts tying into, you know, that, you know, other hardware vendors appearing. So I've got someone from Dell glaring at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys haven't subscribed yet. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so with that, so with things like in terms of different hardware partners, I guess it's it's been great for Microsoft to sort of be able to go out and say, hey, look at how well Surface integrates, et cetera, et cetera, which is a great story for the Surface team. But I'd actually argue that it's not so great a story for the Intune team because I would like to see a lot more hardware vendors on here, obviously starting with Dell, seeing that they are the majority of the machines we've got in the room today. Yeah. So I'm getting paid a dollar each time I say Dell. So <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> Something's been <laughs> chilled. Oh, yeah. I've got, I'm taking the rest of their marketing budget for the year. <laughs> you want me for the week? We, we want the Lenovo as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so in this case, I think, yeah, Steve sort of, yeah, Steve said, hey, look, HP connector in here. So we thought, you know, good to show that it's not just, you know, that it's not just surface. So, yeah, so basically, like what we're seeing over on the DFCI side, we're starting to see it uh, open up a bit. Or it's not, not that it's opening up a bit more. It's that others are taking advantage of what's in there to hook into. And obviously, these are things that take time. And Look, I can imagine the conversations that go on inside these other organizations before they commit to something like this. There'd be so many competing divisions in those organizations saying, but if we use the, if we do that, that means it's going to upset this group, this group, this group yeah. or whatever. So the fact that it takes time it doesn't really come as a surprise. Um, now the final thing over here is just over on the in that policy section, just sort of showing in here now that remediations is now in there as a top level. Um, feature in here. Now, just a quick thing here is, is that uh, for remediations to show up as top level, what you need to do is stay in the old device view. Uh, if you switch to the new device view, it hasn't it hasn't inherited these updates yet. Luckily, they'll be re They'll the forks will remerge, and then who knows what will what will get spit out at that point. But that's really it in terms of just the updates. We didn't want to spend too much time on these things because we've already got two big or yeah, two big topics that are very closely related to each other. So what I'll do is hand over to Aresh who will pretty much jump in and and go through these uh, these two topics for you. Sure. Thank you. Just give me a second. I'll start the screen share. Let me know if you're able to see the main deck, not the presenter, presenter mode. Yep. yep, everything looks good. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining this session. I think this is an update, so we're not going to touch the basics, what we did last time. Can we have a show of hands as to anybody who attended the last session? I know three people are here. <laughs> <laughs> But anyone in the audience? Yeah, Jeron, I remember. Yeah, absolutely. And Phil, yep. Dean was probably there too. Oh, lovely. Eddie has a show of hands. So, okay, that's great. Uh, so, 50% uh, 
uh, seems like we had attendance, but nonetheless, uh, I, I haven't included the overview, but I'll just throw in some bits and bobs of it. So let's get it. Let's get started. My name is Aresh Sikari. I'm a senior solutions architect at Dell. I am uh, eight times VMware V expert and well, first time Microsoft MVP. And essentially, my MVP is on Windows 365 devices from a category standpoint. And I'm probably awaiting the Azure Virtual Desktop segment, which is called as Remote Desktop Services today. You get renamed and then probably apply for that category. So uh, for context, last year we did a session Thank you. Last year, uh, not last year, maybe four months back, yeah, some four, like that, three yeah. or four months back, we did a session around an uh, overview of Windows 365, where we actually went through what was Windows 365. We compared it against Azure Virtual Desktop. So we've done that session. Now, in this session, what we really want to do is all the updates that have come in in the last four months. We would like to touch base on that and see what each product has in its kitty of releases. Uh, we, we are mainly touching big, big topics, not like a small check mark button, which came in the console for that product. We're not doing that, but only big ticket items, which are worth mentioning. And then we will wrap it up with demo. Uh, most of the segment, what we discuss here would have a demo, but whatever doesn't, we can just have a quick discussion and see if there's any questions. And last, not the least, we'll wrap it up with questions in the room. Uh, for the audience, just a quick one. What is uh, Windows 365? It's nothing but a cloud virtual desktop for your end users, which can be centrally managed, maintained using existing tool set from uh, Intune. And the beauty of this particular desktop is that it is uh, scalable, resilient, and predictable cost, which is a very important uh, element and a differentiator compared to any other offerings in the market. Uh, you may ask why why do, I, why do I make a statement like that? It is, uh, it, it is a fixed cost. So for example, the two CPU, eight gigs uh, machine uh, would cost 70 Aussie dollars and it's a fixed cost per month, whether now you use it for one hour, two hours a day, or 10 hours a day, or into 30 days, doesn't matter. It's a fixed cost that you've signed up for 70 bucks for that uh, cloud PC for the whole month, which is compared to a lot of solutions, even if you went on to competitive solutions, is a very good pricing and managed and maintained by the same tool set which your IT is used to, which is a very big differentiator again. Uh, simple to manage compared to Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, we will, I'll see if I can do the same thing for Azure Virtual Desktop as well, and then see in the audience, if we still have a question, uh, a burning question, what is the difference between Win365? I hope there's none. Uh, there's enough differentiation in each of the products which Microsoft has created. So you, you, you better know which product are we picking and why. But we'll try to see if we can do something similar for uh, Azure Virtual Desktop as well. I'll, I'll pause here and see if the audience has any questions on what is the Windows 365 Desktop. As I said, the deeper session was last time. This is just a quick overview, but happy to take on any questions as to what, uh, if we have it in the audience as to what is Windows 365. Okay, uh, I think we are good. Uh, so let's move on to quickly to new things that have come in. So um, for, for, for context, uh, if, if you know within the admin portal, if you went up to setup.microsoft.com, there is a deployment checklist for Microsoft 365 already. Uh, recently, 
the Windows 365 team has managed to put a deployment checklist, which during our demos, that will be the first thing we'll go through. But I just wanted to highlight that it's a very comprehensive uh, checklist. It takes you through almost all the possible scenarios where you would be deploying your Windows 365, such as whether your uh, Windows 365 would be Azure AD joint, whether it's going to be hybrid joint, whether it's going to be on the Azure network connection, which is your own private connection, or whether you're going to host it on the Microsoft hosted network. And depending on which options you pick and choose in the deployment, it will further give you more details as to what goes in. So it gives you a somewhat a readiness, like a readiness checker or a readiness wrecker for the Windows 365 desktops. Uh, phenomenal tool, like if someone's just getting started and has no clue as to what would be required from a deployment perspective, can go into this particular link. And we will be seeing a demo shortly. And it takes you to all the scenarios. And depending on which scenarios you can choose, it will give you additional details as to what is required to make it all happen. So fantastic uh, enterprise deployment checklist. Very recently added. It's as new as 45 days old. This checklist got infused. We'll take a look. The, the idea here is finish off all the features that have released, talk about them, give an overview, and then we will take a look in the demo section of each and every feature that we are discussing here. Uh, the next feature, next uh, in line, it's a public preview of moving the, win the cloud PC. And what, what this essentially means is that uh, imagine you deployed your Windows 365 cloud PCs in Australia East, let's say, hypothetically. Uh, at this point in time, uh, there's only East, but let's say if there was something like Southeast for the sake of argument, right? We had another region and you decided to change your cloud PC from Australia East to Australia Southeast. So earlier on, there was no option to change the geography of the region. Now, there is an option right into the uh, provisioning policy where you could move not only the region, but also the network. So let's say if you decided that you want to change your desktop's network, the Windows 360 that, uh, network from Microsoft hosted to your own Azure network connection, which is your own private connection to your on-premise network, then you could also change the particular network. So now both the options are in place. You could not only change the region of your uh, cloud PC, but also have the ability to change the network uh, of the cloud PC and, and vice versa. So if you did your Azure network connection, which is your own network, and you decided to switch on to the Microsoft hosted network, both the options are now possible and feasible. And you can change the region as well. We'll see, we'll, we'll take a look uh, in the demo, just a quick note on this particular feature, you could do 100 cloud PCs at a time, and it is recommended that you do this activity over the weekend. So what, what essentially would happen is if you decided to go down this path and you wanted to change the, let's say, region of the uh, cloud PCs, it will, after you enable this and you click on apply, apply the change to this provisioning policy, it would in the next 10 minutes go in and shut down all your cloud PCs and make the move happen after that. Hence, uh, there's a big disclaimer that you do it when you have a planned downtime and just don't go about randomly clicking. And if you hit the apply button, which is on the screen, it will start happening in the next 10 minutes after you hit the apply. So plan this particular activity over the weekend. Give or take, uh, you could say, put 10 to 15 minutes per desktop as a, as a downtime related activity, uh, all subject to the Microsoft hosted network and the communication going back and forth 
Uh, personally, I've never done it at such a big scale of 100. But just to give you context, from a context perspective, you could do in batches of 100, and it, it, it will uh, do it in batches of 100, even if you had thousands of desktops in your cloud provisioning policy. So that's a pretty neat feature. Uh, 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 it was a bit of a deal breaker for people uh, in the days where they would say, hang on, I've deployed it in region A. Now I would like to move the cloud PC to region B. And it wasn't an uh, a -abil ability. So now we have this particular capability to move it. Moving on to the next uh, very recently released feature, uh, bulk manual restore points. So uh, bulk restore uh, or bulk actions is within in tune where if imagine you had an outage, let's say, and a corruption across your cloud PCs, and now you wanted to make a restore to the last patch or maybe restore 24 hours back, and you wanted to do this particular action in a bulk base. So earlier, you couldn't do this, but now, you, there's a new feature where you can even create a manual restore point in bulk for your cloud PCs. We'll take a look, it, it, it is uh, inside the bulk actions and you could select few actions. We'll also take a look at what are the different actions, but the latest one to get added is uh, create manual restore point for your cloud PC, um, which never existed and it also, you, you could also restore the backup uh, of the cloud PC in a different region, which is pretty neat. So imagine a scenario where uh, instead of move, the earlier option where we saw move, think of an option that you wanted to restore the cloud PC in a different region, then this is the option that you would use using the bulk uh, device action. And we'll take a look at the uh, options in the UI as well. I'll pause here and see if there is any questions before we move on to the few grand topics or the big releases that came in. Any more, any, anyone has any questions? So just quickly, Uresh, not a question for this. Could I just get you to move your laptop this way a little bit? Yeah, just, yeah, just to start yeah. talking to the mic. Yeah, yeah, just to get a clearer part to the mic. It seems like the mic is being very directional. So, yeah, so let's just- look close to me. Yeah, so we'll just test that out to see if, yeah. Let me know if it doesn't go well. I'm happy to put on the headphones quickly as well. But yeah, let, let us know if, if it's not helpful. It's just right next to me, the mic, so not, not sure why the audio quality yeah, yeah, is. But I think we remember that other time I was using this room and we were getting that same feedback and I was pretty much sitting where you are. So I'm wondering yeah. if... If you want, I can quickly jump there That's if true. that makes any. Well, let's just see if just people have the same issue. Yeah. We'll, right. We can swap places. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, any questions? Any questions on any of the feature releases that we've talked? Remember, whatever I've discussed is just a consolidation of the last three months. Okay. If no questions, Let's move on to the big ticket item, Windows 365 Frontline. Massive announcement in conjunction with another feature which we'll talk right after this. What is Windows 365 Frontline? For, for a very long time, uh, the only Windows Cloud PC that was available was a, a full desktop and which was tied to one user at a time. Now, always there was a need or ask for what's in store for shift workers. So what I meant by that is people who came into the office, work for eight hours, and there were three shifts in a day, they would log off, move on, 
their physical endpoint, uh, which is acting as a client, moves on to the next person in the shift. And there was always a need of a shift worker style desktop where it wasn't locked down to just one user at that given point in time. You could have a flexibility where you, you could have multiple concurrent users using it at a slightly discounted price than the full license. Now, a very important thing to note is this is not a substitute or this is not your strategy that you could put all your workers or all your employees under the front line. You really have to like bifurcate which particular user in the category falls under a shift worker versus a full-on license. So let me break it down a little more, a layer down as to how this could be bifurcated. So let's say a user like me, who probably works random hours all the time. I don't have, like, I wouldn't be working a fixed set of hours. I could probably put in 13 hours a day at times or probably sometimes six hours a day. And probably scatter my work throughout the day. It doesn't matter. I don't have a fixed set of time of working, let's say a hypothetical example. So for a user like me, it wouldn't make sense to go and get a frontline worker license because guess what? If they assign a license like that to me, I'm blocking that license throughout the whole entire day. So if there was the benefits to be reaped for a shift worker who just comes in and goes at a particular shift, then this particular license is much suited for them, not for people who are working more hours or random time. The availability of the desktop is much higher than a shift worker would have. So important thing to note that make sure you understand which set of users would fall under the shift worker category and which fall under the all-time access. And depending on that, you buy the license. Now, what is the advantage of this license? Why this particular license? The license comes with a very unique flavor where it allows one frontline license to have three cloud PCs provisioned for you. Uh, just note and, and, and emphasize that if I use the term provisioning. And this is what confuses a lot of people that, uh, in fact, it added to my confusion as well. I actually had to ask a question to the product group to get even more clarification. Wait, and hence I put this diagram together, which even uh, displays how many license would be. So let's say hypothetically, if we had 40 people, how many licenses would we need? Just going by the one is to three ratio, if there were 40 people, we probably would be fine with 13 licenses. Did I do the math right? I will get, are 36. I will get you to move up. Yeah, we're still getting the audio issue. And I, I think it's that spot. Yeah. That, uh, I can hear him well. I can. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> Just a slight shift, guys. Is the audio better now? Just keep talking through any physician. Okay. So when we so back to the example of 40, let's say from a 40 user standpoint, if oh, I think it's better. Okay, yeah. lovely. Good, good, good. So we we technically needed 13 licenses, give or take, yeah? 30, 12 is a 36, 13 is 39, yeah. 30, 30, give or take 13 or 14 licenses is what you need. Now, what this essentially license does, it allows you to provision the desktop and keep it ready in the backend for that user. Nothing changes from a cloud PC perspective, it's still one-to-one -one mapping of a desktop to the user. However, the way it is powered on and utilized 
is the differentiator of the license versus the regular enterprise license, which keeps the cloud PC on all the time, doesn't matter how many hours do you use it, versus this shift worker, which allows you to provision all the users. But the concept, the second concept in the frontline worker, which is the concurrent or active user base, kicks in. So provisioning allows you to create the desktops and keep them ready for your user base. However, how many active or concurrent license you have at a given point in time so that your users can work, which we see in this next example. So 40 users needed 13 licenses from a frontline perspective just to get 40 desktops created. However, let's further break down this particular example now you had a requirement at any given point in time, you had 20 active users. Now, that's the differentiator. You had all the cloud, pro, uh, cloud PCs provision, but if you want 20 people to be working at a given point in time, you need 20 frontline worker licenses. And that's where you need to pay attention that two concepts, provisioning the amount that you have, so you could probably have 100, 500 people as an employee base, which could be categorized as shift workers. However, at a given point in time, if 100 were working, you need to accommodate for the 100 licenses, which will allow you to power on 100 frontline worker cloud PCs, and 100 people can be working at a single point in time. So a very important concept. So please emphasize on the concurrent active users that you have at a given point in time in your shifts and accommodate the license for that. Plus, it's also advisable that you give or take have a 5% to 10% buffer of licenses so that if at all you didn't account for the right amount of licenses, you will not, the new cloud PCs or the new frontline workers who come in shift and want to connect to your frontline worker cloud PC, they will not get a desktop. They, they would get a message that there's no license for you. So is there a grace period for changeover? Yes. So if we're changing shift, what's that window? Is it 20 minutes, half an hour, five minutes? What, what or is that? Yeah, that brings to a very another interesting concept because remember the license is tied to that particular session and keeping intact. So it is important in production, you deploy the ideal session timeout policy through Intune. So what that does is lazy users who would not log off at the end of the shift and would hold up a license, which will not allow another user to go in. You could set up the ideal session timeout depending on your organization needs, let's say hypothetically 20 minutes in the policy. Yeah. So after 20 minutes of the session remaining ideal, it will get kicked off. So, so then there's no shift changeover scenario. You're expecting user A to sign off before user B can yes. sign off, which is okay and it's not a problem. Um, yeah. Now the other thing that I, sorry, can I, I'll point out something in your slide that you might talk about in a moment. But the thing to sort of notice is that the final bullet point where it's got the shift worker who works 7.5 hours. So notice that the example is deliberately not saying eight hours because 24 divided by three equals eight. Um, because there's not a buffer that goes, oh, hang on, it's shift change time. Therefore, we'll give you a capacity for an extra 50% or whatever to allow the shift change. That's, that's, that's the point that I Yeah, see. so so that would be, so that would then tie back to that 10% buffer. Buffer. Where, yeah, and the way that I, <laughs> going from some previous conversations on this, um, what you have to sort of, you have to watch this carefully. Yes. Because... Kind of like with anything, people are going. Some people are going to look at this and go, "I think I can almost manipulate this so I can get it closer to enterprise user requirements." Yes, but I'm only paying for the frontline slash ship, and it's cheaper. Um, but it's yeah, I, and I think they're kind of being hard and fast about some of that stuff. 
So the yeah, so that seven point five hours is kind of important, right? Because if they send three eight hour shifts, it's like okay, uh, shift one sign off on the count of three, two, one. All right, shift two. Now you can sign in. It's that's not something that's going to work in a production environment. It is. If you've got, absolutely right. So yeah, so that's yeah, so that's seven point five hours. People might look and go, why are they saying 7.5 hours? It's because if you said eight hours, that that is going to open a world of pain. Yes, absolutely. And I think two key takeaways to tackle this in production, right? So the first emphasis is there is a report. So the good part is all the front line can be reported. We'll see it in the demo. If time permits, we'll go back in the demo and see the frontline worker desktop. And it'll give you the uh, report which enables you to take a better decision. Second aspect is maintaining a decent size buffer. You definitely have to uh, nail down your requirement of the concurrency rate at a given point in time for your user base or frontline. After you nail down that particular concurrency, add a 10% buffer, or even to begin with, add a 15% buffer, and the report will tell you how the utilization is going on. And depending on what you see in the reports, you can further tweak the numbers from there. But definitely, this is not something where you set and forget, because very soon, if you don't have session ideal uh, timeout configured as a policy, people would be just utilizing that session and not allowing your other shift worker to utilize the license. So definitely keep a uh, watch out on the report. And for production, you have to uh, enable the session idle timeout policy. And depending on the organization needs, because one can argue, and I, I, I'll bring this example as we are discussing production, right? So let's say if your ideal timeout value is 20 minutes, right? Imagine lunch break scenario, right? You would, you would at least go on a 20 to 30 minute lunch break, right? And that's where it becomes a bit tricky because if your ideal timeout is 20 minutes, by the time the user comes back from his lunch break, the session is gone, as in it's logged off. And then he's going to create an IT ticket for you saying, why did I lose my session? So what, you, so what you're suggesting is that we should only de deploy this that way in countries where workers don't have rights <laughs> and they can't have lunch. <laughs> I never said anything. I, I, I suggested you review your policies, your user behavior patterns and set up the session ideal timeout. This way you don't get, it because it, you would like to be aggressive. I get yeah. the point, like I, I would want to put a 20 minute timeout, honestly. But in a, in a practical world, it, it, it's just gonna be like 30 minute lunch break and the session is gone and the user is gonna make a complaint that I, I lost my session. So hence 45 minutes sounds about right. But then the 45 minute example ties up to the set, like the end of your shift kind of example. Hence that maintaining a right buffer, 10, 15 percent, 5, 10, 15 is very important for this license. Definitely savings is there in this particular license. It is cheaper than the enterprise. So I know for a fact a lot of people are evaluating this license, but having a fine balance between your buffer, your ideal timeout policy is the way to go on this particular feature. But excellent uh, tick in the box, uh, uh, excellent tick in the box that you could have a cheaper license to take care of the shift workers. Okay. Let's move on. The are the big feature following this uh, as an announcement, which is Windows 365 boot device. Uh, this particular feature was announced last year, but at a very high level, there was this announcement and a very small 
brief demo is what I remember on uh, Dynamics, uh, uh, the Windows, what's that YouTube channel? Oh, Microsoft Mechanics. Mechanics, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Microsoft yeah. Mechanics is where they drop that particular yeah. hint and a, a drop that there's this feature coming in, and that's about it. And better part of almost a year from that drop or nine to 10 months from that drop of that uh, feature uh, discussion, nothing happened until recently where the Windows 365 boot device, I think it got launched during the MVP summit, yeah. right? Yeah, it was like either a week before or a week after. during or a week after. Yeah. It was pretty week close. After. Yeah. Very close to the MVP. And in fact, a lot of lucky people did see it in person over there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm very close to the demo of this, but just couldn't make it work. There is some failure of Windows 365 boot on my PC uh, uh, for the demo. Else I would have shown you this in live, but I can show you the console, the whole configuration of the backend and what it's trying to do on the endpoint as well. So what is this particular feature? Let's extend to what we spoke about as a frontline worker. Let's go back to the shift worker example. Hypothetically, let's get an example of a call center. A call center has a given seat or a given device out there where three people in different shifts come in and log in. Now, what you could do is on a, any Windows 11 based device, you could set up Windows 365 boot device. On the sign on screen where we typically sign on on any Windows, instead of logging in locally, the icon changes to the top of Windows 365. And when you enter your credentials, and you could also have multi-factor authentication or FIDO key base or any, any conditional access. That's fine, just keep going. You guys hear us? Thumbs up? No, no, yeah. no. I think the camera turned off. <laughs> Okay, a video drop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Audio is still trying. Are you guys able to hear us? Can we give a thumbs up, down? Okay, lovely, thanks. So the call center example where that particular shift worker goes out and they're supposed to log into that device. Now, every single time a shift ends and the new user comes in, when on that particular Windows 11 endpoint, he is directly logging into the cloud PC. So from a user experience standpoint, you could give that particular user a feeling where he could leave whatever work he was doing and continue the next day directly from that particular window. So that's the kind of uh, user experience what you could end up giving uh, to a user directly from the physical endpoint logging into the Windows 365 Cloud PC. Uh, the feature at this point in time, uh, once enabled, doesn't allow you to go back into your physical PC. And which is obvious, right? What you don't want is people mucking around on the PC as well as using it for a seamless login experience into Cloud PC. Hence, they've curved it down there is some feedback. I, I saw there was a feedback asked, what, what would you like to see in this feature? And there was a question around that, that do you see a use case where you would like to access the local resources of the PC? A end of the day, remember, it's a proper Windows 11 endpoint. So technically, uh, they, you could use resources on this particular PC, but right now, the way the public preview is going on, it doesn't allow you to use the local PC. However, when you open the task manager, it does show up the task manager of the local PC. So that, that's the... Uh, uh... Okay. Sorry, I was. I shouldn't be reading the comments. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that's where the Win365 boot device is. Exceptionally easy to configure the uh, option. Uh, you could, we'll see it in the uh, wizard. You could, if you had your existing Wi-Fi profiles, VPN profiles, you could even pu push all of that together uh, to enable this particular feature. Uh, at this point in time, in public preview, there is a bit of work to enable it. And what I meant by that is you have to go and enable the Windows Insider and subscribe to the dev channel. Once you enable it on the dev channel and additional reboots go through it, that's when uh, the policies that you configure in Intune starts getting pushed onto this particular device. And after subsequent reboots uh, and installation of certain elements like which we'll see, which is failing right now on my environment, you will be ready to uh, log in and utilize this. And it, it is a very seamless experience. Like I wish I could showcase this today, but imagine we'll see uh, because it's on my VM, I, we could see that on your login screen, instead of logging in locally to your PC, you directly from there log into the cloud PC. Uh, exceptional for frontline worker use case, exceptional for a shared endpoint in an organization where imagine you had to use that particular device for multiple uh, users who come into shifts. So exceptional feature, uh, and I think it's just gonna get better from here. This is just the first release. Uh, so I'll pause here, see if there is any questions. Yeah, I think, yeah, so Dean's called out something, yeah, pretty important here. Like, yeah, I saw you being distracted by the comments, but it's that, yeah, remember though that, yeah, this is another element that you're going to have to harden down on that device. So if the user does break out and get back and they've got unrestricted access to everything, um, it's a bit of a, it's, or it's more than a bit of a problem. Uh, so it's, yeah, so it's not like something like, maybe over time it becomes something that is just so locked down that you have to start opening things up to allow it to work. But now it's the opposite. Now it's, exactly. it work, yeah, it works, but you need to be the one who controls the security around absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think a uh, very valid point, this particular argument is gonna be two-sided. Some people would want to use it for other things. Some people, yeah. I would say, it's better you can't use it because that way the device is locked from a configuration standpoint and you know what to expect day in, day out of that particular device. And additionally, a thing to note is that all your existing feature set of Defender for Endpoint, as well as autopilot, uh, auto patching, is applicable in this scenario. It does configure and set up the policies for auto patching. And if you had integrations into Defender for Endpoint, you can leverage all of that existing. So there's no net new, you don't have to think what I'm gonna do for the patching. You could leverage the auto patch uh, and, and all the rings that it creates automatically for you. Uh, I think it is that time that I feel I've been talking a lot without any demos. So I'll break here because the next slides are for Azure Virtual Desktop. So let's wrap up all the demos for uh, Windows 365 at least. Now, let me know if you are able to see my workstation. Yep, awesome, thanks. So the first thing, we'll, we'll do exactly the same order what we saw in the slides. Uh, the very, oh yes, uh, I'm doing uh, load testing for Edge browser with the tabs. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story, except they're all sleeping and you can see the little hearts. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, the very first one was the deployment checklist. As I said, extremely comprehensive, one place 
or one-stop shop to look at all the requirements before you get started uh, for Windows 365. In, in this particular case, I've selected Windows 365 Enterprise. Uh, you need to go on to, the link is in the deck as well. So it's setup.microsoft.com and Windows 365. Remember, there is similar deployment guide, Steve, even for Microsoft 365, right? I, I know about the 365, but I think there are a few more products where they have this deployment checklist type. Uh, there are some other products out there. I couldn't list one off the top of my head. Yeah, right now. but 360, Microsoft 365, for sure, has a similar style uh, deployment checklist. So it asks you, this is a very valid question, right? What which network or what is your cloud uh, PC deployment option, whether it's Azure AD Join or is it Azure AD Join plus Azure Virtual Network or is it hybrid AD Join plus Azure Virtual Network. So depending on what you select, the following uh, requirements and following details would be carved out, which will help you in doing the right decision. So let's say we've selected Azure AD Join plus Microsoft hosted network very simple. This is the most simple option. It's 100% cloud-only option. You don't need Azure subscription or we, we'll see, like, if you are interested, I can show you the Azure network connection, which goes back into your Azure subscription, which can go back into your on-premise network for uh, for communication. But this is, a, this is uh, where we, this is the simplest form of deployment, 100% on Microsoft, which is Microsoft hosted network and Azure AD join. Uh, so it will ask you, uh, what about the identities? Have you set up a group and have you assigned that group the Windows 365 licenses uh, yet? So the, it gives you a priority and it tells you about the item. Uh, why is it important? Obviously you need a group with the users assigned which you will be using in the cloud provisioning policy and the Windows 365 license is associated to that Azure AD group. Uh, it'll ask you further more questions. Uh, what, what are the uh, physical devices have access to the remote desktop? What, what about the latency? So it's, it's making you think, even if you like imagine it, you never thought about all the scenarios of the cloud PC, this particular setup guide is allowing you to think on each and every aspect, whether a short path is required, whether you have latency issues and you would like to go down the path of the UDP protocol for the communications to your cloud PC instead of TCP. So it, it gets you into the mindset of thinking through the entire setup that would uh, follow on for your cloud PC. And similarly, if you go next, uh, have you acquired the current license? Have you bought the, have you got the, either the enterprise or frontline worker license or even business for a matter of fact. But remember this checklist was for enterprise. So this is not for business. It is purely for the enterprise. Uh, do you plan to use the resize feature? Very important uh, design decision. If you think that you have to resize your cloud PC, it, it, it's giving you a thought process that you could start with a small cloud PC of two CPU, eight gigs of RAM, if tomorrow you thought about upsizing it to the four CPU gig, you have the feature to resize that. Uh, other features about the MDM enrollment uh, into Intune, uh, do you plan to do Windows updates? So it, it's just giving the whole idea out here is to give you a feeling that it's taking you through each and every aspect of the cloud PC deployment for you. So that's that's a quick demo. The whole list is very detailed. Uh, the link is in the deck. Uh, make sure if you're starting, my recommendation is if you're starting new to Cloud PC or if you're doing a new production deployment anytime, start with this for your customer. In fact, I, like I would even go to the point that I would extrapolate all the points listed here, put it in a spreadsheet and make it like a nice fancy checklist for the customer as well to say, yep, 
we've do, uh, done all the due diligence. So this is just the thought process for people who would do it in the field. Okay, so as I said, there's lot, lots of meat here until you hit finish. We're not going to, I'm not gonna bore you through the whole wizard. So we'll move on to the next feature. Okay, so the next one was, let's take a look at the move option. That's pretty cool as well. Uh, go, go into your provisioning policy. Let's say the, let's pick up the Windows 365. You need to come here. Uh, first thing, you, first things as in what, what got added, let's say hypothetically, right? The very first thing which got added is apply region changes to the existing cloud PC. The, the option that you see over here, that's the new, as I said, you could change the region. Now, coming into the edit part. Now, this is where you could go ahead and change the options. That is, if you thought of changing your net network connection, this is the place. If you want to switch from Azure Network Connection to Microsoft, So remember what I said in the deck. The moment you hit this, after 10 minutes, your cloud PC shuts down and it starts moving depending on what you've selected. You mentioned something about the cameraman. They couldn't hear it. Guys, are you able to hear us again? Oh, no, no. Camera. Camera yes. just Camera. died. It's because we, 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 yeah, we've used this room before without that issue. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Jaron. Are you able to see us and hear us? Yeah, we've got it. Awesome. Thumbs up. So, so this was your place where you could make these changes as well as apply, uh, move, move to the region from here. So the moment you click apply, it will, in the next 10 minutes, shut down and make the move happen. Hence, the big caution is you do this over the weekend. If you would like, use the notification options which uh, Mark showed you for Windows 11 in the intro today. You could send in notifications to your users that this is going to happen. They don't need to know the, the region and all of that, but just like a downtime notification that some some smart employee of yours decided to work over the weekend all of a sudden and is wondering, why can't I log into my Windows 365 desktop? So those kind of, you could use notifications and uh, carry out the comms before you do this. Uh, so that was your second feature. The next one, bulk move. Let's look at the bulk. So go into devices, all devices, and that's where you have the bulk device app, uh, option. Now select the OS, obviously it's Windows easy. Now there's a, de if you bulk actions, it can be performed even on the physical devices or the uh, managed devices through Intune. So hence there is a device type category where you, you are telling Intune that all the bulk actions that I want is with respect to the cloud PCs. And the latest into the uh, list of action is create cloud PC manual restore point. So now imagine if you wanted a point in time restore point right now, which is which, which like you could do it manually by going into all the cloud PCs one by one and 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 triggering the restore point, but imagine 
you had to do this for 100. That, some it. smart people had done it through Graph API. I guess. Uh, they had developed some PowerShell scripts through Graph API doing this, but guess what? Now it's right into the console, makes your life easy, much more controlled, uh, and a uh, few options, as I uh, highlighted, you could do restore, place the cloud PC under review. So this is nothing but, uh, let's say, uh, there was a security incident, a hypothetical example, which I'm making up right now. If, if there were like 25 compromised cloud PCs, which you wanted to perform uh, security investigations, or you would want to give those PCs, uh, stop using them for production purposes and wanted to uh, give it to security for review. So you could place the bulk action of putting cloud PCs under review. So this is, this is a great option. Like e even a while back, similar thing, you could put cloud PCs in review. I've written some blog articles on this as well, uh, but you could do it one by one. Now it's like a bulk action. If you, if you knew 25 PCs, you could just put all the 25 in, into review once and for all. And that's restore, repo provision, sync, restart. Th those actions were there from day one. The latest one, as I said, was doing the PC uh, manual restore point. So that's around the bulk actions, moving on to front line. <clears throat> Any question? Yeah. The Monday review makes them unavailable or not? Yes. It will, after you put them into review, the, it's not for the user anymore. It, typically, the term, the better term used in the industry is called as legal hold. If, if there was legal retention requirement or security review is becoming a hot topic these days, they want to take your desktop. So I, I've written blog articles where it's a, v, 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 uh, a VHD disk and you could then just use that VHD disk with modern tools to do analysis even without powering it on. So, because end of the day, when you pu pu put it on the uh, legal hold, it is sitting inside your Azure storage account. So it, it's just imagine sitting on a file share wherever you want within Azure. And then there are certain RBAC roles where you could offer that desktop just to a very security oriented RBAC role for review. So let's take a look at your frontline worker. So I have this uh, existing policy for frontline. Uh, let's hit edit and go through it. Uh, as I said, you need to make a decision whether you're gonna use enterprise for whom and frontline for whom. So in, in this case, I already have an enterprise grade po uh, provisioning policy. This is your frontline demo. So you pick frontline as an option Select the joint type, whether it's going to be Azure AD or hybrid AD, uh, AD joint. My big recommendation is go with the Azure AD joint native, reduces all the burden. Most of the technology is coming at par, which works natively with Azure AD. So more and more, the reliance is reducing uh, on the AD environment, and I don't think you need it anymore unless there's some corner case somewhere on the planet, which is fair. Network, uh, in this case, I've taken the easy route, Microsoft hosted network versus Azure network connection. For those who are new for Azure network connection, it's nothing but your own dedicated VNet for say, which can talk to your backend on your network. So you can control it through the firewall Azure firewall and block the necessary ports as per your desires uh, using the network. Now, you still have to use Azure best practices. Hub and Spoke would kick into the picture and also 
your network connectivity from the Azure subscription back into your on-premise, if at all you were doing that. So uh, express route would be needed as well. Uh, select the geography. As I said earlier, in Australia for Windows 365 at this point in time, there's only, at least in my subscription, I can only see Australia East. Hence, my earlier example that if you wanted to do from e Australia East to Australia Southeast, Melbourne, uh, that's not an option today, but I'm sure the way regions are getting added, it's, it's phenomenal work in the back end. I wouldn't be surprised in the next three months, I would be able to see Canberra as well. Because in Azure, native Azure, you have all these regions. So if you were doing storage accounts or normal Azure related work, you have uh, Australia Central, Australia Southeast Melbourne, uh, Australia East uh, Sydney. Do we have something in Perth? Yes, Australia. Yes, right. East, Australia East. East. Australia East or Singapore, depending on what routing works better for you. No. <laughs> There's no Azure data centers in WA. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. So you need to have a a good ISP. Yep. <laughs> okay. So that's where the region is. Uh, very important tick in the box. Do you want single sign on? Remember, if you don't tick this, there is a prerequisite for this. Doesn't mean if you tick this, it's going to work on Windows 10. No, it won't. You need Windows 11, 22 H2, some, some specific version of the 22 H2 onwards is when this particular single sign-on feature. I Back in the day, I did have Windows 10-based cloud PCs and essentially the single sign-on would only work on Windows 11. So what it would mean is that when you log into, we'll see in a demo of logging into a frontline PC uh, shortly. So when you log in, instead of getting prompted twice for your credentials, if, if you don't enable this, you will be prompted twice. If you enable this single sign-on experience, you just log in once onto Windows 365 and in you go directly. So very important. Uh, people, uh, I've seen customers where this feature got enabled, let's say five, four, five months back. So they would, you would ask, what, what if I've, mm, I don't have it? You could modify the existing provisioning policy. However, it would need a reprovisioning of the cloud PC for this to come into effect. So there is downtime in, in, if you enable it afterwards. So uh, thing to note, not a concern for anyone who is using latest builds like 22H2 onwards, not a problem at all. So it will work flawlessly and seamlessly out of the box. Uh, click review and done. The uh, provisioning would go and kick in and create. Now, remember what I said, um, it has, so my frontline policy, I've managed to create three frontline worker desktops because that's the license I have. So remember one license could do three. Uh, something which I wanted to showcase uh, and I did blog about that. That's why I just wanted to quickly go on to my blog and show you what's the error, which I can't show you in my tenant right now. So, what, so let's say I just have to license, right? And I, if the third active session kicks in, what would happen, right? And this is exactly what uh, you would get. A message, and I, I, I did say that there is a frontline worker uh, report as well. It says that you've reached the concurrency limit. Hence, the third person, because I only have two uh, licenses, so two concurrent sessions, I could provision three cloud PCs because one license can enable you three provisionings, but at a given point in time, if
their questions. I could get three provision, but I couldn't log in. And that's where the concept of concurrency kicks in. And it's a very important concept to. That's when they're still So it's so it's every 14 minutes. What's it, there's a timeout on it that's kicking in for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thumbs up, guys, whether you're able to. We've got a, Eddie's already said audio is back. Awesome. Okay. So th that's the prompt that you would get uh, if you wanted to deploy in the, the post that I, I mentioned uh, on my blog is you can deploy instead if you didn't, if you went lazy and you didn't want it to do it through the UI, you could do it through single shot through the Power CLI using the graph APIs for um, Windows 365. This is what it explains in detail on how to do that. Uh, that's just a plug onto this topic. Um, get, getting back onto the demo. So that's frontline worker. Let's uh, log in. So simple, depending on what you put in the provisioning policy, if you paid attention, it was called as demo frontline. It's saying exactly the same thing. However, you could rename to whatever you want now in the UI. And for the demo, we'll launch it in the browser. So what I was saying earlier, if you, did not enable, oh wow, this is new. So it tells you now that disconnect when finished, it's even warning you. The same topics that we were discussing that uh, the importance of essentially this particular feature is that user doing the right thing, which is again rare in this day and age, user doing the right thing. Uh, hence, a big warning that please disconnect after you finish because your license needs to be uh, given out in the pool and someone else is going to use it. All the experiences from a logging perspective remain the same. There's no difference from a user standpoint uh for his cloud pc and i'll i'll quickly once i show the ui element i'll go back into intune i wanted to show you that it's still one to one desktop one de one cloud pc one user only difference in the way it's getting consumed is microsoft is managing that pc on your behalf for 7 hours power policy only so they they're using some more intelligence to power it off not keep it on all the time, not to bleed more resources, hence a bit cheaper as well from an enterprise license comparison. No, I think uh, it, it's uh, after doing the updates, I've not logged in back. Yeah. Hence, it's taking a while. Not that it, it's typically if I've after the updates, if I've done login, it, it, uh, it, I haven't logged in onto this frontline worker for the last three weeks. So when it asks you for the location, re, uh, what it's doing, it's doing redirection as well. So it's gonna start showing you the time and everything based on the location where you are in, rather than what the cloud PC's geographic location could be. 
So this is just your redirection. You've logged into your frontline PC. You get that seamless experience and continue using uh, the cloud PC. Now, one thing which I wanted to quickly demonstrate is this element that there is a there's already Microsoft has confirmed that they are going to put a feature over here where there's going to be a new a column type called less powered on or powered off. So you would be able to see whether the front line, because that's only applicable for your front line because your typical enterprise cloud PCs, they remain powered on all the time. Doesn't matter what time they get used. So now what I wanted to show you is this particular section where I was saying three cloud PCs, they all are assigned to individual users. So what I've done is after the cloud provisioning policy created three cloud PCs, I had three users, three separate users, where I logged in one by one, it assigned that particular cloud PC for that particular user. So now these are dedicatedly assigned for this user for the life of the cloud PC. So, uh, so back to that point that they are dedicated one-to-one uh, desktops for you. So that's where the uh, front line. Any questions out here before I can quickly show you the failed Win three Win three sixty five boot uh, demo? Okay, if no questions. So what what I really wanted to showcase is that. Right now, just like the way you seeing my profile, instead of seeing my profile uh, during the login, right now I've signed in, so it's just got locked and I'm re-logging in. But imagine this was your sign-in screen. Instead of seeing what, what you're seeing as my profile picture, if there was a picture, there would be a Windows 365 logo out here. And when you signed in, you would directly get into Cloud PC. So right after you enter your username and password, it will say connecting to your Cloud PC. At this point in time, it is taking over 30 seconds for that connection directly going in. But Microsoft is working towards uh, improving that timing. Now, what I was showing earlier is everything I'm inside the insider program, I'm into all the prerequisite that have been met. There's only one small caveat at this point in time around uh, what, like I'll show you the failure, it'll come out here. There you go. So there's, the, there's this problem which is uh, stopping for the last final demo, else I would have been very happy to show you the demo today. Uh, like this is getting blocked. Not sure why is this failing. It'll need a little bit debugging and troubleshooting with the logs, but this is what is stopping. But if this was not the case from the sign-in screen, we could have just directly logged into, instead of doing it through the browser or the client, we could have directly gone into Windows 365. Uh, so that's where the boot device is. A uh, few prerequisites which I can quickly share with you. Uh, Windows, uh, you need a window. Let, let's say you start with uh, either the insider build for 22H2 latest releases, or you start with 22H2. After you start with 22H2, you get in here, come into Windows updates, uh, get into Windows Insider Program. Uh, once you once you come here, it'll keep prompting you for two, three pop-ups. You'll have to select a ID which you want to associate for the Insider Program. And once you've done the Insider Program, the other critical element, what you need to select is what Insider channel you would be subscribing to. Uh, for using this feature as it's in uh, public preview, 
you have to use the dev channel. So this is where you select the dev channel. After you select that, it's going to give you another few pop-up boxes where you say yes, 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 and it'll reboot. After the reboot, you come into your Windows updates, and you need to click on check for updates, and it'll start deploying the Windows 11 inside of preview 22 something something uh, towards the end, and it's going to take another reboot. So at least after enabling this, you should expect two reboots more after enabling, and that's how you put uh, you get the insider builds. Remember, this is preview uh, feature, hence it is a bit tedious to get it enabled. Once it goes GA, it would be baked into your uh, cumulative update uh, for the month and the feature would start getting rolled out seamlessly without doing all of this. And that's how you do it. And the policy, which is worth seeing, going back into Windows uh, 365 uh, portal in Intune, get on to this. So how now your question would be, how do you enable Win365 boot? I've already enabled, so I'm not, uh, but I'll show you the wizard. So you come in here, it takes you through this wizard-based installation. Very simple. We'll quickly look into uh, what, what it's asking. Hit next uh, for any, if you want to give your devices some naming standard, come here, give that. In my case, I did not bother giving it a naming. You could select what prefix naming you want to give Windows 365. So you could, so whatever you select here, let's say W365, the moment you put that, 65 slash W11, whatever. You could start seeing that at the bottom, whatever is going to create, it will append your naming context over there automatically. What all it's doing, you can see it's it's deploying the Win365 app in your devices. It will enable autopilot. It's going to put device configuration policies. It's creating all of this and uh, boot enrollment status page all of these policies automatically for you within your Intune to, uh, tenant. Once you select all of that, once you select all of that, hit next, it will give you a summary. Uh, it'll ask you what is your user experience, what's your working hours, select your active working hours so that it doesn't go and uh, start booting your cloud PCs which you're configuring for the boot. So that's why it's asking you for your active hours. You could select the feature update days deadline. In my case, I've just selected two for the uh, dates deadline. And quality updates, deferral, select whatever based on your so this is exactly the same thing if you were to create your rings if you're not using auto patch and you were to create your rings this is exactly what you answer there it's creating for you on your behalf so that's why it's asking you these questions out here in the wizard hit next now as i said there's options that if you had your vpn your wi-fi profiles for your physical endpoints you could select the profiles out here. So it will push those particular profile and uh, uh, Wi-Fi profile onto the devices which you are enrolling for your Win365 boot. So that's also taken care of for you in the wizard. Uh, select the preferred language uh, 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 for the device. In, in my case, you could select English, Australia. There's almost all the regions. Next is assignment. Here, it also gives you an option you want to use an existing Azure AD group where, and this particular Azure AD group needs to have all the devices which you are enabling for Win365 boot. So you could pre-create a Azure AD group, or you can over here select a new group, put a naming convention of your choice, whatever Win365. I've, I've already done that. So boot device demo. So it will create this, and hit, once you hit review create. It'll go ahead, create all of these policies for you. Now, 
one, and that's how you enable the demo. One, one more option, which I wanted to showcase you, if you did not want to go down the path of enabling the insider build manually, you can also use this option. Go into your update rings. I've created a update ring called as dev channel. So all you do is within the uh, within the update ring, come here and select uh, enable pre-release builds. Remember, if you just do for the first time, this is where you need to select enable. And in the uh, pre-release, select dev channel. Once you do this, select your active hours based on whatever you want. Assign it to the same Azure AD group, which I asked you in the previous uh, demo where you put the machines that you want to enroll into Win365 uh, boot device. So that same Azure AD device group can be attached. Hit finish, wait and watch the device starts getting enrolled into the dev channel. So the important thing with this setting is if you hit the enable pre-release builds, or even if you touch it in that policy, it's going to force your device to restart when it applies, because it is one of the few CSPs that have a mandatory restart on it. 100% and I can totally attest to that. I saw it immediately after creating this particular update ring, it went ahead and rebooted that particular device, which I wanted the Win365 boot to be enabled for. So right. be careful applying it. Yep. Only strictly think about your activities at what time are you doing it. So as there is a reboot involved, pre-plan or postpone your activities to off business hours, if at all. So this is another way of enabling insiders without doing it manually. So just thought of sharing this. Uh, so that concludes, our, uh, I'm extremely unfortunate that I can't show you because of this particular error, which I did highlight. So I'm stuck here. It's not able to install this. We, I, I still have to troubleshoot. Once this is done, you could have, I could have shown the demo. The demo is nothing but simply sign out here. The, instead of my picture, as I said, there would be Windows 365 logo. You logged in with the same credential which you would log on to Windows 365, hit enter. If you had multi-factor or feeder keys uh, required or any type of conditional access policies that you configured, they would get challenged over here. You could even enable multi-factor authentication and all those authentication methods can be addressed here and people, uh, the user would get into the cloud PC directly. He would not come to know, not even the slightest bit that he's inside the cloud PC because the experience within the client or in the Windows client is seamless. Like it's one of the best experiences I've personally seen by any vendor, because I've also worked on a lot of other solutions, which are not Microsoft, and thin client solutions, which have tried to do something similar, but not managed to do it the way, right now, the way Win365 boot device is enabled. So something very flawless experience for that matter. Um, that concludes all the demos that we had at least for Win365. Look, seeing if there's any questions in the audience. No questions, that's gold. So back to the deck. Uh, we are almost in the final Azure Virtual Desktop world. Okay.
you see the resume feature? No. So, uh, so it, I, I left the presentation there, right? Mm -hmm. I, I went back into Teams and did the share the app PowerPoint. It detected where I left. So it gave me an option. Do you want to resume from where you left? You hit resume, it directly came onto this slide. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay. Uh, as I promised earlier, I did an overview of Windows 365. What is Azure Virtual Desktop? Azure Virtual Desktop is the very first offering for the virtual desktops for Microsoft. It's an enterprise grade uh, product where you could do all sorts of different integrations and do tackle different use cases other than just desktops. So Azure Virtual Desktop, you could even use it for delivering applications. So imagine you did not want to offer your user a desktop. You just had the requirement to offer the user, let's say Microsoft Word. If that was your requirement, you could, you wanted a different solution. Now, Azure Virtual Desktop offers the flexibility of different offerings, let's say, let's see what. It can give you a one-to-one -one desktop, just like the Windows 365. So you could get a one full-on virtual machine just for you. You could have a shared desktop that is one multi-session, like it's called as a multi-session desktop. So one desktop getting shared across 15 users. So 15 sessions are maintained on that particular desktop. So you could have that. Profiles could be maintained for those 15 sessions using something called as FS logics. So profiles are also, so you user gets a feeling that he's, he's getting the same desktop again and again. So the profile part is taken care of by FS logics. Then coming on to the next use case that you just wanted to deliver applications and not desktops. So that particular flexibility can also be done through Azure Virtual Desktop. So what? So what? So what's the wrap up out here? If you wanted to deliver different use cases other than desktops, then Azure Virtual Desktops is the way to go. What I am seeing in the market at this point in time is a combination being used. Anyone with a bit of knowledge can see the importance of Windows 365 and its ease of adaptability and the ease of existing teams taking on to the venture of Windows 365 management and desktops versus if you were doing Azure Virtual Desktops, in my humble opinion, you need more of an Azure architect and an Azure engineer than a desktop engineer. If 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 that make if that gives you a perspective from a roles and responsibility standpoint. So in short, if you had to do Azure, you needed much more of an Azure architect and an Azure engineer. If you were to do Windows 365, you could get away with Intune and the desktop engineer managing the whole Windows. Series. So uh, for all the guys who understand finance, that can mean a lot in terms of your expenses for the resources required to manage and maintain an environment. You probably need top top end engineers if you were doing Azure. You could get away with desktop engineers if you did Windows 365. It's a, it's a very simple way of explaining the costing model. Yeah. Uh, and sorry, just something I want to add on to that is I've seen scenarios where people who don't know Azure at all, but yeah, they may have worked with RDS or whatever on-prem, and they're thrown into the Azure world to look at AVD, but it's like the, like as you're saying, like the RDS piece of it is almost the smallest piece of the knowledge that's needed. And so you've got people who, you know, so starting off with things like they don't understand you know, subscriptions, resource groups, regions. So there's all these things that 
they're kind of like fumbling their way through, trying yes. to get something to the point where they can then apply to things that they understand. And it's like, and it's that's not saying anything bad about those people. It's just that sometimes it's like, you know, RDS, therefore you must know AVD. And it's like, <laughs> no. Yeah. Like, yeah, those skills will sort of layer on over the top of the finished product. Um, right. But it's not the thing that's going to allow you to build a good AVD environment. 100%. And I would even go a step further because someone had posted a message on LinkedIn that you could do Azure Virtual Desktop, blah, blah, blah. If you ask any Microsoft employee how to do Azure Virtual Desktop, he's going to come back and tell you it's better done either through Bicep or Terraform completely automated yeah. and i'll tell you right now i won't say that i'll say it's better done through windows 365. there you go <laughs> so now just extending this thought furthermore it can become overwhelming the moment you start talking about those tools as i said if you have the right engineering team using those tools your life gets much more easier if you did it through CI, CD, and DevOps, the whole Azure Virtual Desktop Management. Not saying that, I've seen the opposite end as well. Normal teams just managing it through the UI as well. Not doing Power, PowerShell based or through Terraform or anything of those sorts. And then there is another set of people which I've seen using the Nerdio Manager which is a tool to manage Azure Virtual Desktop and Windows 365 and Intune a bit now, they're going into the Intune space as well. So you could use a manager manager, a manager of manager to you manage the uh, Azure Virtual Desktop through Nerdio. So that's another, uh, another piece. Now, in, in short, I hope there's no question at this point in time in the room that what is the difference or when to use Win365 versus uh, Azure Virtual Desktop. Does anyone have a, any, any questions on that topic? If not, we can continue. So we did cover Azure Virtual Desktop in the past sessions. Uh, new things that have come in. Uh, I'm not sure this is, the, this, this feature is more DevOps oriented. So, Earlier, Azure Image Builder, which was building your templates through Packer in Azure, it was done through a lot of command line and a lot of interacting with PowerShell, and it was pretty raw. What right now with this release, what they've done is they've integrated Azure Image Builder directly into the UI and they've made it just like any Azure workflow where it's more graphically input-output oriented. You put in a lot of parameters into the form of the Azure Image Builder, and at the end of the uh, wizard, you get an image built out from uh, Azure using the automation. So earlier, as I said, it was a lot of PowerShell integrated. You had to do a lot of back and forth, but now the whole Azure Image Builder use it for custom templates if you wanted to. The argument would remain, why would you want to build a custom template as well? Because you could just pick up the image gallery from uh, the Microsoft Marketplace and use that, and then built upon that through Intune by pushing applications using that method. That's one way of doing it, but then you have a different set of people who still want to make their own images. There's no good reason why, but they are those type of people who still are into touching that image and making it their own kind of a thing. So uh, I believe the term comes down to ego. Right. Most likely. Or there could be some very important reason like government or some like, you know, that we need something before before we can't wait for Intune to push that particular application after we need it firsthand. So essentially, uh, Azure Image Builder 
which is now in, in the UI, gives you the whole uh, mechanism to do the development of your image. It also enables you to update the image regularly and in an automated fashion. So rather than you doing the image manually every single time and putting it in the shared image gallery as a version and then using it, instead of doing all of that manual steps, you can leverage the automation and it becomes clicky clicky and you could get a template in no time. So new release around, around that. Oh, the difference is earlier it was very PowerShell command oriented. Now it's in the UI. Uh, another release around storage account. This is especially the profile part which I was met. So what is FS logic? FS logic is nothing but the solution which holds your profile. It holds your office profile. It holds your user profile for you. It has intelligence around. Uh, it has intelligence around uh, excluding OneDrive and uh, other exclusions. It can it it can be customizable for inclusion and exclusion. So essentially, there was a there was an issue where to use the storage account with FS Logics, you had to use hybrid AD which is somewhat contradicting to the earlier point which I raised that make sure you go Azure AD native. It makes the whole management aspect easier. Uh, this particular feature has been dropped and now you can integrate your FS Logix shares directly using Azure AD Kerberos. Uh, so it gives all the users who use, who are primarily Azure AD, a seamless experience to the profiles rather than getting double hopped for authentication. And first it was not working altogether. Now it, it works with this particular feature natively for Azure AD. So even more important that try and go down the path of completely Azure AD based uh, join as well as user base that you don't need back, the only way to access your Azure Virtual Desktop was through the client called as Remote Desktop Client. Now, <laughs> 14 minute mark, there you go. <laughs> okay, let us know if you are able to hear us. Thumbs up. Okay, so the way, okay, lovely. So the a while back, the way to access the Azure Virtual Desktop was through the remote desktop client. Now they have a dedicated app in the store called as Azure Virtual Desktop, which is in preview, but uh, it, it's like a dedicated app, just like the way you have a dedicated app for so back in the day, the remote desktop client, you could connect your Windows 365 desktop as well as your AVD from that single app. Now they've gone ahead and bifurcated both the apps. So there is a dedicated app for the Windows 365 desktop, uh, which has new features as well. And now they, they've segregated the Azure Virtual Desktop into the, its own app called Azure Virtual. So no confusion in short. Dedicated apps, dedicated client apps, for each of the solutions. Uh, last topic or last feature, awesome feature called as Uniform Resource Identifier Schemes. Now, uh, to explain this feature in a different way, uh, let's go back in the, uh, so sorry to strain your eyes. Uh, however, if you see the center screenshot of the client and the apps uh, which are highlighted, out here. Now imagine if you wanted to access Word, it had to be in your uh, workspace over here in the app to access it. What if I told you you could deploy a shortcut inside your client where 
a single set of icon, let's say word, which would point to the URI of the Azure Virtual Desktop app directly. So instead of delivering full apps within the client, you could have, now going coming back to this example, you could have a shortcut in your taskbar for Edge where you had that URI pointing to the Azure Virtual Desktop backend app directly. And in a single click, when you clicked on that particular a shortcut, it triggers the app in the backend. And you, you, you never had to plug in, you never needed to plug in the app in the workspace. Though it's recommended to have the workspace and all it means you have to plug in, but this gives the user a very seamless experience for certain things that they want at a wink of an, not a wink, probably at a click that, I just want to launch this app rather than going through the AVD client, launching all of that. So these are very dedicated or shortcuts for apps. Very cool feature. Uh, you, I, I can give you use cases where you could deploy shortcuts through Intune with that particular URL in the backend. So you could pre-deploy apps as shortcuts to the user desktop in the taskbar pinned through India. So those are the kind of use cases this opens up. That brings us to the end and opening it up for questions. Uh, there's, no, there's no demo for the Azure Virtual Desktop. There, there's just one, one thing, one, last plug that I probably might leave for the enthusiast around. I've, I've written a full-on series for Azure Virtual Desktop with Terraform on my blog. It's a three-part three series where if you followed the three-part series, you could deploy the Azure Virtual Desktop using Terraform with all the steps mentioned out here in a detailed format and get up and running. I can assure you the time saved with this automation is incredible. Uh, I, I also have a series on my blog for PowerShell Whatever you did with Terraform, you could do exactly the same thing with PowerShell as well. And there is another PowerShell series, which I had done last year probably on this topic, but the fresh series on this whole topic is through uh, Terraform and you could have all your host pools, app profiles and everything created for different use cases with this. Uh, that's all. I had opening it up for questions. Any any topics that you want to go through in detail? Any concern? Check with Steve. Sorry. So <laughs> any concern? Yeah. Go back to okay. that. So what I'll do, I'll just stop the recording now in case anyone's got any questions that they want to ask that they don't want. Uh, they'd rather not have it recorded. Just uh, hopefully they'll. Yeah, make people feel a bit more comfortable. So I'll just stop the recording here. And